among other things to appreciate about Scripture, is that each week when you gather here, it hasn't changed from the week before. You've changed in all sorts of ways. But God's Word stands forever. I find particular comfort in the fact that Galatians 2.20, our text for today, hasn't changed at all since last week when we considered it. You may have sinned in this way or that or realized that you fall short of the glory of God, that in yourself you have no hope, but you can still come to the words of Galatians 2.20 and say, that is still true, true of me, etched into human history by the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, now true and indicative truth of God's word for you to appropriate for yourself. Let's read Galatians 2. I'll read verses 11 through 21, and we'll spend this morning again focusing on Galatians 2.20. Hear now the reading of God's word. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel... I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Pause just one more moment with me to pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and fan into flame that faith that you have begun to work within us. Guide us in your truth. Thank you for illuminating our minds according to this word that you had inspired and written so long ago. Transform us from one degree of glory to another as we consider now your word. Amen. Who are you? Maybe you look at your hands and your feet and say, what? What am I? What is this combination of flesh and bone, of soul and life, and body. Who are you? What are you? What are you here for? Evergreen questions of identity. One of the most thrilling, exciting things about the Word of God is that this world is awash in these sorts of identity questions. Who am I? 
What am I? What am I here for? And in one verse of God's Word, those questions are answered in such a way that you have tremendous hope for the rest of today, for the rest of your life, in the face of death and every trial, indeed, for all eternity. You see, questions like, who are you, what am I, what am I here for, they, they are actually too big for you alone to answer. If you think about how little you know, and that you know how much you don't know, and that you've often made mistakes before, you'll quickly realize those sorts of questions, who I am, what I'm here for, are, are too big for you alone to answer. So it is a tremendous privilege of the Christian to realize there are questions I can ask that are too big for me to answer, but I do have answers for them. I have everything necessary. I have everything I need in God's Word. And those specific questions are indeed answered in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If nothing else, answer that question, what am I here for, in terms of this verse, to be loved by God, who made me and gave himself for me. Martin Luther found so much hope in what is taught in the book of Galatians and wrote a tremendous commentary on the book. If you know about church history at all, you know how much Luther treasured being justified by faith and not by the works of the law. He wrote these words about Galatians 2.20. Let us dwell on that word, me. Who is this me? Even I, wretched, damnable sinner, am so loved dearly by the Son of God that he gave himself for me. Read, therefore, with great vehemency these words, me, and for me, that with sure faith you may print this me in your heart and apply it to yourself, not doubting that you are of the number to whom this me belongs. Luther saying, take God's word written through the Apostle Paul and appropriate it in faith for yourself. You don't need to change a single word of it. Make it your testimony, your story, your confession, your profession. You're testifying to what is not true of you and yourself, but what is true and cannot be changed about you in Christ, Christ in you, and what he has done for you. Last week we looked at this and it was something of an introduction to the verse, an understanding that these sorts of statements that bring us to union with Christ and even something like saying, I have been crucified, are rather obviously not the sort of things you come across anywhere else. Other religions, ideology, philosophies, don't bring language like this that is this personal, this intimate, this much union with God himself through Jesus. Uniqueness is critical because it 
brings answers to the evergreen questions we have about our, our identities. And while we might grow frustrated with a culture that is relentlessly looking within to discover answers about who we are, it is helpful for us to, as Christians to stop and say, who am I? Why am I broken? Why are things not good enough with myself? Why do I need anything like a savior? Why do I need to be transformed and changed? But we are not left to our own devices to figure out what that change looks like. Instead, we find in Christ the savior, the one who reaches into our own lives and offers us something radically different. And while last week was something of an introduction to this verse, I think this week we can just look at different concepts so clearly in the verse and take to heart what they mean for us. I have been crucified with Christ. What a remarkable sentence. Oddly enough, this verse that begins with being crucified with Christ is all about life. And you see that repeated over and over. The life I now live, Christ who lives in me, the one who gave himself for me. It's all about the sort of life that is the result of first being crucified with Christ. So we go from death to life and then to loved. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See that one verse coming to you through the word of God saying, I'll tell you about who you are, I'll tell you about death, I'll tell you about life, and I'll tell you about love. These mammoth evergreen questions of identity, who we are. And I believe there are in these words something of an escalation. And, you know, some humility on the part of Christians perhaps keep us from seeing this. We say, oh, it's so good to be forgiven of sins, to be crucified with Christ, to not owe to God the debt I owe because of my sins, to not um, be aware of the fact that I am going to pay for the sins I've committed against the holy, holy God. We see that as such a tremendous benefit that perhaps we don't see maybe something of an escalation in these gifts. Almost like Christmas morning, you don't start out the greatest and the biggest gift. You give a good gift, then you give a better gift, and then you give the best gift. And I think perhaps that's here. All of them are, in a sense, infinite in worth and value. But I think there is something of an escalation. So let's keep that in mind as we look at death, life, and love, crucified, alive, and loved. I have been crucified with Christ. What a remarkable statement of union with Christ. It is as if there Paul is looking back to Golgotha's cross, the darkness over the earth, the nails causing the blood of Christ to pour from his hands, the crown of thorns causing Christ to pour blood from his brow. It is as if Paul peers back to that, and not just to the crucifixion, but to the moment when Jesus Christ says, it is finished. And Paul says what is true of Jesus Christ there at that moment is true of me. I am crucified with Christ. And what a remarkable thing it is that the Christian faith begins here. You want to know the good news? It begins with crucifixion. I heard one pastor say it this way, and I thought it was helpful. He said, it begins with death. It begins with crucifixion. It begins with saying, I am dead. Isn't it good to be dead? And that's a, a profound question that really rings true for us as Christians. That's where our hope begins. We look at the bad news of the law, the condemnation that comes through it, but we go to the cross and say, in Christ, I am crucified. I am dead to sin. It's good to be dead. Now, I want to um, offer 
just a, a small insight on the language behind what is here translated into English for us. I have been crucified with Christ. Because Jesus Christ speaks of the Christian life as bearing a cross. Take up your cross and follow me. He said to his disciples, follow me. And the way of Jesus is the way of the cross. And there are so many times in life for physical reasons, for mental health reasons, for the griefs and agonies that life brings to us, that we, in our own ways, become men of sorrows or women of sorrows, that we identify with Christ, we feel the pain, the grief, the affliction, the tribulation of this life, and we begin realizing, wow, it's not a physical cross on my shoulder, but this part of my life, this suffering is so intense. I feel the weight of a cross. And at that time, it is comforting to say, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, also endured that. In fact, he calls you to it, saying, disciples are not above their master. Take up your cross and follow me. But here's the thing. When we as Christians endure suffering and bear the cross assigned to us and walk, in a sense, in the way of Jesus, we don't do it perfectly. If you are honest with yourself, even if the grumbling and the complaining doesn't come out in verbalized form, and it often does, you'd realize that there is within us a point, a groaning, a sort of sideways glance towards heaven in the direction of God that says, really? Is this really necessary for me to endure this difficulty after I've been through so much? And therefore, we need to be comforted by Galatians 2.20 that doesn't say, I am being crucified with Christ. Now, that really is true. That's what Jesus says. Take up your cross and follow me. But Paul says, it is equally true that the crucifixion Christ finished, the death you deserve to die, the entirety of God's wrath against your sins, all of that taking place on the cross has been completed. So what Paul uses here is the perfect tense. It means something completed in the past that has a result right now, today, in the present. He says in this perfect tense, I have been crucified with Christ. And this is where our hope begins. It's said so many different ways, but the hymn, the hymn says it best. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. I bear it, no Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Each of you attending to these words from God in faith can say, despite my circumstances, despite how good my last week was, despite how bad my last week was, despite how many times I've committed the same sins over and over and over, this is true of me it was written here last week when we looked at this verse. It hasn't changed between now and then, and it won't change in the future. I have been crucified with Christ. It is finished. Just for a, a second. Isn't that glorious that in the book of Revelation, it says, Worship the lamb that was slain. You see, it's not just saying worship the second person of the Trinity. It's not just saying worship God, worship Jesus. It's saying think back to the crucifixion, even in heaven, for all eternity. 
you'll be able to say, I've been delivered from the penalty and bondage of sin because I have been crucified with Christ. Worship the Lamb who was slain, who was crucified, who was offered for my sin. Death, crucified. Remarkable that the good news begins with being crucified. But I do think there is an escalation here. And perhaps being so focused on sin and the weight of it and the holiness of God, we're reticent to look at what goes on to transpire in this verse and see it as something of a graduated gift. Certainly, it's wonderful to have the penalty between us and God canceled. But the bulk of this verse is about life. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not just that I'm in Christ. It's that Christ is in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I live. I'm alive. It's this life from Christ that's in me. And my life is one that I now see as being in him and think about all the different ways that the Apostle Paul is so concerned to say this, my life is hidden with Christ in God. For me to live is Christ. I no longer live. The life I now live is Christ in me. I'm alive. Here I heard another pastor say something that brings us to an appreciation for this verse here today, this very moment, as you sit there. Somebody said to a pastor, I can't wait to enjoy heaven. And the pastor's response, why wait? You see, Paul has that in his mind. He doesn't say, when I die and go to heaven, I'll live with Christ forever and ever. He doesn't say that. He says, I am alive in Christ. This life I now live is the life I live in Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I live in him, and I'm seated with him in the heavenly places. He doesn't say, I'll die and go to the heavenly places, but I am seated with him in the heavenly places. I am crucified with him. I am now alive in him. I am dead to sin, alive to righteousness. I am no longer of the kingdom of darkness, but now of the kingdom of light. I am no longer a, a son of unrighteousness and sin and Satan, but now a son of the holy, holy, holy God living unto him in Christ. It's a current present reality. Nothing about this verse is saying, wait till you die and go to heaven. It's saying eternal life by knowing the Son of God has already begun if you believe. Because Christ has been crucified once for all. That sacrifice is finished. You have been crucified with Christ, but you are, lo and behold, alive, living, breathing, thinking, worshiping. Therefore, recognize that the life you now live is Christ in you and you in him. And the reason I say that's perhaps uh, an escalated gift, I mean, as great as forgiveness of sins is, think about how there's just, there's no end to this gift of being a son or daughter of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. We can look at sin and say he paid the penalty in full. There is no more wrath. It is finished. But when it comes to life, eternal life, as a member of the household of God, as an heir along with Christ who calls upon God as Abba, Father, and looks to God never as condemning judge, but always as loving, caring, Almighty Father? There's no top on that. There's no limit to it. The problem with saying something like, all right, here, here's a little bit of an illustration. Your sin is a debt you owe to God. Let's say that's $100 million. And then what you pick up through a life in him is him actually giving you $100 million. 
is there's no way to even begin to calculate either of those gifts, but especially life in Christ. Jesus says, I am not ashamed to call you brother or sister. No value can be attached to that. Eternity will be spent realizing how significant, how glorious, how wonderful it is to be considered sons and daughters of Christ, in Christ, with Christ in us, being united to Christ to the extent that God is our Father. Crucified, alive, and for so many reasons, I just can't help but think this statement here is really the best for last. This life in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Personal, intimate, all questions about identity. Who am I? Why am I here? Inevitably, they come to the need to love and to be loved. And think of the nature of this love. Think of the sweet surprise of this coming at the end of this verse. It says, here's two of the greatest things that you can never establish for yourself. Forgiven, now blessed with newness of life as a son or daughter of God because you're united to Christ. And that's not enough. You need to see those monumental gifts that you could never secure for yourself as expressions of Christ's love for you personally, individually, as an entity in yourself. Because he loved you. Because he gave himself for you. Think of that love, a love that drove him to that. It's the most, it's the best, it's the superlative, it's unsurpassed. Fiction cannot come up with better gifts to give than these things. Always best. For all eternity it will be best. And if you think about the nature of it, it's astonishing. It comes back to why I keep saying these words don't change. They haven't changed from last week. They won't change next week. Nothing about this verse changes based on you and your performance. Nothing about this verse changes based on the suffering you're enduring, the affliction, the hopelessness you might feel at this very point. It is true, regardless of anything to do with you. This crucifixion took place before you were born before you had committed the sins for which Christ loved you and was crucified for. You see what that does to this love? It doesn't just recognize it as the best, the superlative, something worthy of everlasting, infinite worship. It declares this to you. God could never love you anymore. He gave his son out of love to secure these things for you. He could never love you anymore. But he could never love you any less either. Do you see that? It's apart from your performance. It's apart from your circumstance. It's apart from what your last week looked like. The nature of this love is that God made you, not for sin, but for life, even eternal life. And he made you to receive his love. And isn't it glorious that later on in the Bible we read, we love because he first loved us. It's not just to receive his love, but to show forth his love, to reflect his love, to have that life of Christ so much in us that our lives are about love first 
to the God who loved us and gave his own son and saved us from our sins and delivered us into life, even in the eternal life that begins now. God who has done those things out of love, we begin to shine forth love, first towards God, then towards those around us. Who am I? What am I? What am I here for? God's word comes to you saying, say these things in faith. Read these words off the page. Commit them to memory. Have them in your thoughts always. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And maybe best of all, who loved me and gave himself for me. Here once again, Luther's admonition. Let us dwell on that word me. Who is this me? Even I, wretched, damnable sinner. So loved by the Son of God that he gave himself for me. Read, therefore, with great vehemency these words, me and for me that thou with sure faith may print this me in your heart and apply it to yourself, not doubting that you are of the number to whom this me belongs. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for not leaving us to our own imaginations, our own thoughts, our own devices. Thank you that when it comes to the very big questions about who we are and what we're here for, your word shed so much light, even through just one verse. We ask that you would encourage us in the way that we should go. Make these indicative statements, these unchanging statements, accompany us as we continue the pilgrimage that you have us on, as we take even the first breaths and steps into the week that you have before us. Make us to rejoice, to have Christ in us, and to be found in Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Last week we sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible in Galatians 2.20 tells me so. Today we sing, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, considering that it is for even a damnable sinner such as me.